as stated, my, my specific topic is the creation of the world. But overall, we must keep in mind that there are only two possibilities to correctly explain our existence, our ultimate existence. That is either eternal mind or eternal matter. And as Brother Warren so well put in his debate with Dr. Anthony Flew, these two form a disjunction. Either one is true and the other false, or in this instance either God is that eternal mind, that mind is the truth, or it's not. Only one of these can be true. And if you've not seen that debate, I would strongly encourage you to do so. Now having a little bit of a background in science, I thoroughly enjoyed chemistry, still do. In doing those different experiments, you had to observe things. You would put a couple drops in a beaker and something happens, well you write down what happened. You have to actually see it. You have to observe it. And that's a major part of science in general is that need for observation. No human was there in the beginning. No one. But we know of one who was. We find in John chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. We find in verse 14 of that same chapter that that was Jesus. That Word is Jesus. Now we get our term logic from that word, logos. The eternal Word. The eternal logic. And we'll have more to say about that shortly. As we stated, the, the goal of this lesson is to discuss the creation of the world. We'll also beat up a little bit on evolution. Um, we'll also take a look at how others have attempted to sneak evolution within Scripture. Various theories dealing with that. And I'd also like to point out a few more aspects of design that we can observe throughout nature. So we're concerned with beginnings. So in Genesis chapter 1, Verses 1 through 5, we find in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. In verse 1, we find five important fundamental concepts mentioned here. In the beginning, we have time. God, we have force, power, and authority. Created, we have an action. We have something that was done. Heaven, we have the concept of space. And earth, we have matter. We see in the beginning that God created the Hebrew word for bara to create form or shape from nothing, ex nihilo. The word heaven, shamayim shamaya, refers to the universe at large, not where God reigns. And the term earth comes from the Hebrew word eretz, which we should note at this time, this is not planet earth, this is matter in general. The building blocks for the rest of the universe. Often the atheist will ask, where did God come from? You spend so much time talking about the law of cause and effect. Where did your God come from? Well, the fact is, whether it's eternal mind or eternal matter, something must exist outside and before the emergence of these things we just talked about. Time, space, and matter. These three form a continuum. Keep in mind, you have a trinity creating a trinity of trinities. Time is formed of past, present, and future. Space is length, width, and height. 
And matter exists in solid, liquid, and gas. All three of these concepts, these three entities, had to come into being at the exact same time. If you, if you have a jar of dirt, which the atheists would praise, because that's ultimately their, their creator, when would you put it? Where would you put it, if not space and if not proper time? These three must come into existence at the exact same time. Have no better spot than the beginning. The best the atheist can come up with is the Big Bang, where nothing exploded and made everything. Now, I've been in a been a fan of explosions for quite some time, and every time you blew something up, and there was chaos after it. The atheist, the agnostic, the evolutionist has it backwards. Nothing exploded and made everything and eventually came complex order. At this point of creation, as we've just read, the earth consisted of all the elements needed to make the stars, planets, and various life forms. We know from verse 2 that this earth was without form and void and in water. Second Peter chapter two, or I'm sorry, Second Peter three, verse four through five. We also see in verse two of Genesis one that the Spirit of God moved. This word rakaf means to brood, flutter, move, or shake. We find this idea in Deuteronomy chapter thirty two, verse eleven. The idea of this word is how a mother hen collects her chicks, tries to keep them warm. She's making these different movements take care of her young. We have this pictured with uh, the, the Holy Spirit preparing this matter. Kohler writes, it seems that at this point God began to energize the raw material that He made in verse 1. The oscillation on the face or the surface of the deep, which is really what the hovering could be compared to, created the movement of the inert elements. It is interesting that all matter and energy at their core are simply wavelengths. Matter acts as both a particle and as a wave. In verse 3, God commanded light to be, and it had no choice. It had to be. Within these verses, we see all three persons of the Godhead active in creation. God the Father gave the command, the Spirit energized the raw materials, and we see the second person of the Godhead executing the Father's will. As we, as we read earlier in John chapter 1, the eternal Word. What was the Word that we, we read about? Let there be light. And there was light. Light be, light was. We see in verses 4 and 5 of Genesis chapter 1 that God pronounces this as good. And he calls it the first day. In verse 6, is, 6, 7, and 8, we see God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Firmament is, is simply an expanse. Specifically, God made the atmosphere. Now this is a second heaven that we see used, and it, it's referencing the sky. Again, it's not the reigning place of God. This atmosphere was designed to separate water from the water. Well, we have what we know of today is our, our oceans, our lakes, and then there's a canopy. There's greenhouse gases. And because of that, you know, the world's ending because it's heating up. Forget the fact that we have seasons. But there is water in our atmosphere. That's the principle being discussed about here. Again, we see in verse 8b that God pronounces this is a good event and He calls it a day. Genesis 9 through 13. Uh, chapter 1, 9 through 13, 
It says, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit yielding tree. I'm sorry, the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. If you start studying evolution, they say life started in the water, this primordial gloop. One of the theories that they use for the existence of life is the bubble theory. And it's you have the ocean and some gases bubbled up and lightning struck these gases, this random mixture of chemicals, and it formed an amino acid. What many fail to realize, there's a right side and a left side. In genetics, if you don't have the proper mixture, you will never have life. And they tried to duplicate this experiment and they failed even after cheating. Because they tried to mimic what they called the beginning, but they, they altered their, their experiment to try to get the results they wanted. And because of this lightning strike of the gloop, the special amino acids, eventually it got into this pond we've talked about, the primordial soup. Well, and then eventually what they say, that's what bubbled up and out popped some single cell. And it's, it's always funny to me that you had eventually two single cells and one cell ate the other and it morphed into a single cell organism. That doesn't make any sense. You eat the weak, and they become a part of you. We're not talking about you are what you eat. That's how they explain the emergence of life and the primordial development of all life that we now know of. Now, we must also keep in mind in this creation account that things were not like they are now. The flood of Noah's day altered the shape of the earth, altered the land masses. So we don't have a clear picture of exactly how things were, but God said He made dry land. And instead of gloop out in the water, keep in mind the first life forms, plants. We're talking about the design of all this. God created the light before that. Then He made the plants. Now the plants have light to use for their, their food source, their energy. Henry Moore states, in verse 11, Genesis 1, occurs the first mention of both seed and kind. Implanted in each created organism was a seed, programmed to enable the continuing replication of that type of organism. The modern understanding of the extreme complexities of the so-called DNA molecule and the genetic code in it has reinforced the biblical teaching of the stability of kinds. There is a tremendous amount of variational potential within each kind, facilitating the generation of distinct individuals and even many varieties within the kind, but nevertheless precluding or preventing the evolution of new kinds. A great deal of horizontal variation is easily possible, but no vertical changes. Basically, what that means, God has established second law of biogenesis which is everything reproduces after its own kind. I am so thankful when I bite into a, an apple that I'm not going to find a lemon. I know what it looks like. I like me those gala apples. They're sweet. And they look good. They're quite tasty. I know exactly what to expect based on that law. After the formation of dry land and the creation of vegetation, God called each of them good, verse 10 and verse 12. And we find in verse 13 where God pronounces this as yet another day of creation.
we find day four in, in Genesis chapter one, verses fourteen through nineteen, which reads, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the day, I'm sorry, the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Clearly, the heaven discussed here would be space. This is the same space as verse 1 that's mentioned there. In this heaven, God put all the stars, the planets, our sun, our moon, the lesser light. All of these entities are for the keeping and measuring of time as well as to give earth their light. Now one thing that you might note, in day 1, God created light. In day four, God created lights. I'm talking about two different things here. Henry Morris on this subject elaborates, On the first day, God said, Let there be light. Hebrew word or. On the fourth day, He said, Let there be lights. Or light givers. Intrinsic light first, then generators of light later. Is both the logical and the Bible order. The chief purpose of both the light of the last or the first three days and the light givers of all later days were to divide the light from the darkness. The duration of the days and night was the same in each case, and the directions of light emanation on the earth from space must have been the same in each case. Remember we talked about logos, logic. God is logical. It makes sense. For light to come first, then the light givers. Now we look at day five. Now I, I've, I've got in my notes the American Standard Version of this verse, this block of verses, because I think it sounds better. I think it gives a little bit more depth than the King James offers. Genesis chapter 1, verses 20 and tw through 23, it says, And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created the great sea monsters, and every living creature that moveth, wherewith the waters swarmed, after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. So now we see the waters have been filled with life. Again, logical order. You have light being created, you have the dry land being saturated in water and then formed. Emergence of plant life. Keep in mind what the plant life does. Take in carbon dioxide, make oxygen. Well, every other thing on this planet needs oxygen to survive. Now we look at day 6, Genesis chapter 1, 24 through 31. It says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, and creeping thing, I'm sorry, after his kind cattle and creeping thing, and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, 
and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the field, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So we now see that all the land animals are occupying the earth. This completes animal creation. There's fowls of the air, there's fish in the seas, and now there's critters on dry land. Again, we see the entire Godhead working in the creation of mankind. Let us make man in our image. Others, many have kind of questioned that meaning of being made in God's image. We're going to look at a few points from that. It also deals with some of the issues we've been discussing so far as to why we feel these ways. We receive our physical bodies from our parents, but God forms our spirits, Zechariah 12, verse 1, and is the father of them, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9. Typically, we call this soul or this spirit the soul. The animals don't have that. We've talked about how that lion doesn't go to the gazelle's mom and daddy. I'm sorry, I ate your offspring. It's just looking for a quick meal. They don't have that remorse. Secondly, man is a moral being. We can choose between right and wrong, and we can know the difference. Joshua chapter 4, 24, verse 15. Three, as we have seen throughout history, man has the inherent desire to worship something higher than himself whether it be Jehovah God, Zeus in the pantheon of, of Roman and uh, Roman Greek, Greece, or even the outright atheist which worships ultimately mankind or dirt. And point four, we have that sense of ought. In reading certain history books, Native Americans would grab babies by their ankles and dash their head against the stone. Is there anything wrong with that? Do you kind of cringe whenever... Did you cringe when I said that? Do you cringe when someone murders a baby? Or talks about it? That's what I don't understand about today is... See, you can use an evolutionary argument against abortion. The idea of evolution is to pass on as much offspring as you possibly can. Instead, we're murdering all, murdering all of them. How does that make sense? What happens when somebody mentions the Holocaust? These are horrible things. Typically, unless you've been conditioned to think otherwise, you feel bad at your very core. You think Rover feels that way when somebody mentions something like that? Think that little pet beta fish you might have somewhere? You think he feels bad about multiplied billions of babies being murdered? No, they have no idea what's going on, but we as humans do. We have that sense of ought. We know better. Each of these traits are found only in humans, and it is what separates us from the rest of creation. And though they attempt to do so, the atheist fails in explaining how man could have these traits through purely physical means. It was already mentioned earlier that Oh, we, we simply evolved morals. And we don't do these things because, well, it's just bad for society. That's the best they have to offer. We see towards the end of uh, the day of six that man was put in, put in charge of God's creation. He's responsible for it. Chapter 1 concludes with God designating this as the sixth day. However, this time God pronounces all things created is very good. I've heard it stated several times that mankind was, was the crown jewel to God's creation. We see in day 7, 
in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, they're completed, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended His work which He had made, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it He had rested from all His work which God created and made. God didn't get tired. That idea of, of rested is simply ceasing action. He stopped creating. It was all finished. His plan for creation, the design, was carried out. Now we, we've kind of hinted around evolution. We've poked at it. And oftentimes when, when an evolutionist hears of somebody trying to define it, they're waiting so they can attack afterward because most of the time in their mind people don't give it adequate definitions. But the short definition of evolution that is the best that I can provide is the change over time of the genetic composition of a given population. It's not just change. We all change thanks to entropy. But it's a change in the, in the population's DNA. Now we typically divide evolution into two forms, micro and macro. Macro evolution takes place through four processes. One, mutation. Two, migration. Three, genetic drift. And four, natural selection. So when you see kids eating all these Tide Pods, who cares? It's natural selection, right? Now they claim when enough of these four different types of changes occur within a given kind, when enough time passes, they say 3.8 billion years, then one kind has the genetic ability to turn into another kind. Now when we say kind, we're not talking about a corgi turning into a Rottweiler. We're that's the same kind. We're talking about when Fluffy the cat turns into Duke the husky. Two different kinds. What they're saying is that single cell organism that we talked about earlier eventually will turn into a monkey through long enough processes. And through more time, out pops a human. And there's an article out there that, again, Brother Thomas Warren wrote, which came first. Human baby or an ape like being, or the I'm sorry, the human baby or the woman. Well the the problem is we don't transform into another kind and we are not birthing other kinds. The evolutionist has a hard time answering that question. The baby or the woman. In fact they cannot answer it and still maintaining their evolution. We can, we can observe the change within species. We can observe the change within kinds. Like, I like huskies. I like little wolves. Partly wolf right there. That's just a, a pretty dog. But he's never going to turn into something else. In fact, about the only use evolution has, science fiction. There's different shows talking about it. There's different movies that involve it. That's really the best it's good for, is a good science fiction novel or movie. You cannot observe it happening, one kind changing into another. Now, we, we've mentioned the law of biogenesis. So now we're going to discuss really how, how evolution violates it. J.W.N. Sullivan says the beginning of the evolutionary process raises a question which is yet unanswerable. What was the origin of life on this planet? Until fairly recent times, there was a pretty general belief in the occurrence of spontaneous generation. But careful experiments, notably those of Pasteur, show that this conclusion was due to imperfect observation, and it became accepted Excuse me. It became an accepted doctrine that life never arises 
except from life. So far as the actual evidence goes, this is still the only possible conclusion. But since it is a conclusion that seems to lead back to some supernatural creative act, it is a conclusion that scientific men find very difficult of acceptance. That sums up their entire argument very well. In fact, if you trace humanism back to, at least in our modern time, you'll find its roots in the Renaissance period. Now, we, we, we find humanism in its purest sense in Romans chapter 1. Everyone knew God at some point. But when we fail to retain God in our knowledge, anything goes. If you don't believe the truth, you automatically therefore believe a lie. And that's how most of the world was in that time, and that's how most of us are nowadays, speaking as a whole. But going back to the Renaissance, we owe a lot of this to those Catholics. Now we always joke about the Catholics, but I'm being as serious as I can. When you have a religion that demands, in the strictest sense, by your actions you are faithful and there's no other way, and you have to pay indulgences to remove your sins and so on and so forth, eventually people are going to get tired of how dogmatic and how extremely strict you are, and they're going to attempt to buck that authority. And that's exactly what happened. The modern humanist, okay, you want to bind your law on me? I'll just denounce God altogether. I am now no longer under the authority of that God you say created all things. Because remember, keep in mind, we, there's only two possibilities. Eternal mind or eternal matter. If there is an eternal mind, we owe everything to that Creator. To that eternal mind we know as Jehovah God. So the easy way out is say, oh, there's no such thing as God or gods. Just get rid of religion altogether. Now just what is biogenesis? Biogenesis states that life comes only from preceding life and of its own kind. These principles have been experimented and proven through the means uh, from Francesco Reddy, Lazaro Spallanzani, Rudolf Vercro, and Louis Pasteur. And I'm sure there's many others. Now we find the law of biogenesis in the Bible. Genesis chapter 111, uh, 1 verse 21, 1 verse 24, chapter 1 verses 27 and 28. And each time, note the process that occurred. God acted. A living being was made. Each being reproduced after, or made offspring. And each offspring was the same kind or type as its parents. You don't see a variation from that. Due to the law of cause and effect, causality, in order for creation to be biogenic, logic demands that the ultimate source of that life be itself living. Deuteron Deuteronomy 5, verse 26, Joshua 3, verse 10, 1 Samuel 17, verse 26, Psalm 42, verse 2, Psalm 84, verse 2, Jeremiah 10, verse 10, Matthew 16, verse 16, and a myriad of others describe Jehovah God as living. When you look at matter, didn't think to bring a rock up here today. There's a rock in my hand, right? You know, it's all subjective. Can, in that debate with Anthony Flew, he objected to the concept of dead rocks and dirt. Because that implies at some point it was alive. Well, fine. Non-living matter. This rock. Is it a sufficient cause of life in any stretch of the imagination? Certainly not. As I stated in the previous hour, the cause must be superior to its effect. Logic demands it. Now the argument is not whether or not we came from dirt, 
The argument is whether dirt only made us. Dirt was simply the means of God using to create mankind. Now there's, there's some, some ways that people try to sneak evolution into Scripture. We're not going to be able to talk about all of it. But uh, perhaps you've some, uh, at some point heard of them. There's the day-age theory where they say that each day of creation was instead of 24 hours, millions of years. Well, the Hebrew word for day there is yom. And any time that you see that word, it can be either literal or figurative. Uh, it's a day whether literally from sunrise to sunset or from one sunset to the next. Or it can be literally or figuratively a space of time defined by associated term. As with many words, context determines how it's used. Each time the Hebrew word yom has a number in front of it, whether one, two, three, or four, or first, second, or third, that dictates that it is the number of 24-hour periods. So when God says... Evening and the morning were the first day, second day, third day, ultimately the sixth day. God in Himself is pronouncing that that day was a literal 24-hour period. Otherwise, if that's the case, let's say it was even 2,000 years. That Day six was 2,000 years. Did Adam live to see the seventh day of creation? He couldn't have. He couldn't have. Now there's also the gap theory. We're not going to be able to talk very much about that. But it's a very fascinating, again, movie idea where they say that God created everything and in between verse 1 and 2, Satan disobeys God, is kicked out of heaven, is punished, and all of creation gets destroyed. So the rest of chapter 1 is really a recreation of everything that God did before verse 2. And you're really doing a disservice to God's Word. Perhaps the strongest argument against that is the concept of being very good. Death is only here because of our sin. God could not pronounce very good, or even good for that matter, on a sin-sick world full of fossils if He had previously destroyed all of creation, only to recreate it. Sin is always the problem. We find after the fall of Adam and Eve that they were punished for their actions. We find in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that God, you know, we talked about design and nature, design and creation. God had a design and salvation. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God promised a Savior. And that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, His Son. We've also been talking quite a bit about entropy today. And whoever's been a teacher to one extent or another, you go into a classroom full of students and you expect order. Now step out of that room for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You expect all of them to be on the same level as Einstein? Do you expect them all to be still in their desks, not behaving as little heathens? You have removed order from that classroom. We have removed our Creator from our society. We are witnessing entropy in this country, in this world, because we did away with the Master Teacher. But I'm so thankful He is a loving God. He stands ready to forgive us when we meet His terms of pardon. Part of that is becoming qualified to be His child. Romans 10:17. we have to hear His Word. John 8, 24, we have to build faith in that Word. Be, believe in Him. Jesus says that I am He. We have to repent of our sins, Acts 3, 19. We have to confess Christ before others, Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33. And finally, we must be baptized for the mission of sins, Acts 22, verse 16. Only then are we qualified to be His child. Our sins have been remitted at that point, and we must live faithful unto death, Revelation 2, verse 10. Now, at this time, we stand ready to offer the invitation for any of those who either have allowed sin to cause them to stumble, to remove their 
good standing relationship between them and their father, or if you'd like to become a Christian, either way, let your need be known as together we stand and sing. <laughs>